Greetings, class. I uh, hope everything is going well with you. Um, back again with our, I believe, to be our fourth and last video for this week. And this one talks about climate and resistance in urban education. So we, what we mean by climate is essentially school climate. And what we mean by resistance is how students in urban settings resist from unpleasant um, experiences. Um, and oftentimes how we look at that level of resistance. So I'm going to bring to you some level of scholarship with this, um, even if I don't agree with it. <laughs> so um, I'm going to bring it to you, make sure you have access to it, but then um, you make your decisions on how you see and interpret and how you feel with this. So let's get started. The first concept we need to conquer is understanding of school climate, because we use school culture and climate kind of as the same thing, and truly they're not. Um, school climate is kind of a relationship between leader and faculty. Um, so of the workers in the building, school climate is determined by them and that relationship. School culture is the values and beliefs of a building. And that encompasses everybody. Um, even external people are part of the school culture, which means a community, um, parents, uh, the business community, all of that is part of the school culture, but school climate, which is simply the temperature of the building, the organizational health of the building, can only be limited to the workers within the building. So that's between the leader and the faculty and staff. Um, there are several terms I need you to understand. Um, so I'm going to try to carry through this quickly. Um, I can provide more research on this if you want it. Um, first thing is leader mindfulness, um, or what we call LM. And leader mindfulness is just the fair interpersonal treatment of employers, uh, employees. Um, as a leader, do you treat people with fairness, individuality? Uh, do you see them as individual people that you have an individualized relationship with? That is leader mindfulness. Do you think of them in the moment and do you hear them in the moment? Um, and do you attend to that moment without prejudice of their past? Um, the next one is leader member exchange. Um, which is kind of an understanding of how leaders and followers kind of get along and it comes from the business world. But essentially what it is is a relationship between the leader and the follower. And it, it is a transactional sometimes relationship. So how do they exchange between each other? And we're talking about a one-to-one -one basis. Um, so if you're just thinking of leader to groups, you're probably not doing well on the leadership member exchange concept of leadership. <clears throat> the next is Enroll employee performance. So enroll employee performance simply means it's your ability to do your job based upon the job description. So do you meet the essential standards of your job as an employee? Uh, do you feel like you can meet those essential standards? <clears throat> and that is accompanied by extra role employee performance. Um, and that's generally the activities that you do beyond your job description. Both of those together are called commitment behaviors. Um, and it is the extent to which you do your job and then do more of it, or the extent to which you do less of the job. Um, oftentimes teachers, when they want to do a silent strike, they do what we call work to the rule, which means they do exactly their job and when it's time to clock out, they go. So coming in before school to work with tutoring students is a no. That would be considered extra role or commitment behaviors, staying after school to work with students, giving up your lunch period to work with students or attend to students, um, bringing students into meetings and working with students in that time, um, talking with parents. So it's an extra role. Um, we like to write them in as enroll, but they're truly extra role parts of your job. And then this idea of interpersonal justice. Interpersonal justice is just simply meaning regarding the feelings, wishes, and rights of employees. Um, do you provide as a leader fairness of both procedure and process to individual employees to the point where it works for them but doesn't harm others? Um, so can you provide interpersonal justice without encroaching upon the rights of the next employee? Um, and that's, a, that's essentially what we call fairness. Um, so. Let's talk about some of the findings, essentially, in a lot of research on um, school climate. What we find 
is that leader mindfulness increases the ability to practice leader membership exchange, which in turn increases employee performance. There is an indirect, and some research says direct relationship between leader mindfulness and employee performance, where if you add in leader membership exchange, it enhances employee performance. So let's put this in, in actual terms. Um, fair leaders have great relationships with employees, and when employees feel that they have a great relationship with their employer, their performance increases, their happiness increases, their feeling that they can do their job and feel supported increases. That makes sense, right? Um, I haven't told you much new there. Um, but also leadership mindfulness increases leadership member exchange, which decreases as a negative relationship with stress. Uh, and stress is simply burnout, um, employee exhaustion or exhaustion fatigue, um, and then personal decisions. Um, so leadership mindfulness increases leadership member exchange, which decreases stress, which also increases interpersonal justice. Imagine being an employee who do not believe that you'll ever get a fair shake. And you have a poor relationship with the leader. Your level of stress on the job is going to increase. And the feeling that you'll actually ever get justice will decrease, which also then makes you, if you have the talent to do something different, leave your job. <laughs> so if you can't do anything different, then you're pretty much stuck there and unhappy and according to positive psychology, that's a terrible state to be because that's the majority of your waking hours is spent stressed out on a job. <laughs> so I want you to think about that as you think about school climate. Um, but this is happening on every level, and it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between leader and employee. Next, we'll talk about action. Um, what you see here are two situations, two different schools, but this could be two different organizations or two different settings, however you want to make it. Uh, what you see are two different levels. Um, in the red, you see conditions. Conditions are restraints, barriers, limitations as to what can be done. Um, they could be looked at as rules and regulations. Um, they could be looked at as just restrictions. But those are the conditions that you have to work with in your organization. What's in green are the means, and it's your ability to act, your ability to do something. And one can only do what they know to do. So imagine being in school B, where you have a lot of restrictions and very little room to act. Um, that can create a hostile situation if you're working in that kind of environment. But as opposed to that, if you're in school A, where you have lowered conditions and a whole lot of means, you can be creative. You can be thoughtful. You can actually do work that you want to do and meaningful work. You're probably also probably empowered to do work outside of the requirement. So your employee performance increases. Um, but that is because the leaders have chosen to relax the conditions of the environment. And this is the same even in classrooms. Uh, so for those of you who are public school teachers or teachers in any school, if you create a hostile set of conditions in your classroom, you limit what your students can do. And it also limits their output. Um, and you have to think about that because we often pride ourselves, and many of you will probably train that you don't smile until April. That's a horrible way to think about it. <laughs> you know, when you put these harsh conditions in place, thinking you're doing the right thing, but what you're doing is creating the seeds of rebellion um, within your building, or within your classroom, as opposed to when you go to more affluent schools where we actually believe in students, <laughs> you know, the conditions are extremely relaxed and the means are greater. I've been in a school where teacher took out all the chairs and desks and brought in bean bags, and students sat in bean bags and had class. They were relaxed, they were peaceful, they were calm, they could get up, they could go do what they had to do. Um, they could also come back and move around beanbags. They could move their beanbags throughout the class if they felt like it that day, you know. But their environment was more relaxed and the creativity was better. And their test scores turned out to be better, <laughs> you know. So this does have, even in the standardization idea, this does have positive output for that as well. Now, 
is get this idea of resistance. <clears throat> resistance can be any type of movement away from the expectation and norm. Um, resistance is actually classified by two particular criteria, and that is a critique of conditions and the desire for change or social justice. That is the criteria for what we call resistance. It is a critique of conditions and the desire for social change. <clears throat> now, well, we have a four types of resistance. Uh, the first one, it really isn't a resistance. In fact, the first two are called negative resistance. The last two are called positive resistance. And we'll you kind of see why, but even in our definition, it's written from a leadership perspective. It's written from the dominant class perspective. And it's hard to speak about resistance if you're not a resistor, <laughs> you know? So reactionary resistance is when students lack a critique of conditions and they're not motivated for change. They just want to get the attention of the leader, or of the teacher. So acting out in class for fun, for kicks, uh, to disrupt the teacher a little bit, to play with the teacher is a form of reactionary resistance. It's a reaction to uh, the rules. It's designed to get a reaction from those in leadership or power. Um, the next one is self-defeating resistance, and it's called self-defeating because in the short run, it hurts the person who resists. Um, but it is when a person has some critique of conditions, but no motivation for change. Um, so they hate the condition, but they don't want to change the condition. They just want to get away from it. Um, and what this does, it, it recreates the oppressive condition that a person experiences. For example, Dropping out of school with no aim is considered a self-defeating resistance. So a person who drops out and has no goal to do anything different actually makes the situation worse for them if they wish to engage in this particular economic society because our society gives um, compensation and status based upon educational attainment. So if you don't even have a high school diploma, you're cutting yourself off. Unless you have a talent that's so unique that we're willing to pay top dollar for it, it's probably going to be a hard time. Now, I don't always look at dropping out as self-defeating resistance. I often think dropping out is probably the boldest thing a person can ever do because what they've decided is, I don't care about this institution. I'm going to do this on my own without you, um, which leads to our next one is conformist resistance. In a conformist resistance stance, you need change. So you want social justice, but you really don't have a critique of the conditions. Um, you don't know if conditions are fair or unfair, but you also want change to happen. And this you can see in some students that will hold coat drives for the poor or students who help other students in class, um, willing to get themselves in trouble for talking, but they help students in class. Um, and it's a form of conformist resistance. They were actually willing to get in trouble to help another student, which is interesting, right? Um, so that's conformist resistance. And the last one is transformational resistance. And that's when you have both a critique of the conditions and also you're motivated for change, particularly for social justice. <clears throat> and ways this happens um, is writing essays that critique the system and working very hard to prove the system wrong. Um, and that is often why you see some of the behavior you see at graduations because it was a symbol of proving them wrong. Somewhere along the line, that student felt like someone told them they would never get to this day. So when they get on the stage, they act a fool to celebrate the fact that I proved you wrong. Um, but essentially what it is is challenging the system while still staying in the system. Um, so they have critiques of the conditions, but they once again use their ability to stay in the system to critique the system. So you can feel how you want to feel about these four areas, but do know that they exist and they're based upon these two criteria, and that is a critique of the system and a desire for social change. Um, <clears throat> next, we, were, we apply resistance to this idea of strain or strain theory. Um, in strain theory, you're motivated by success. The goal of all of us is to obtain some type of success. And Merton, who wrote um, strain theory in 1937, simply said that for adolescents, 
um, for the youth, and youth back then was anybody under 25. The goal or idea of success is the acquisition of wealth, money. Now, I know many of you are probably going to say money doesn't make you happy, and that's great because somebody very rich wants you to believe that so you don't want their, their place in society. But let me ask you this. <clears throat> Have you ever had a good Christmas? I want you to think back as a child. If you had a really good Christmas, money did that. Have you ever eaten a really good meal and felt great afterwards? Money did that. Have you ever been able to go into a home in the winter that has heat on and able to turn the lights on and off, watch TV on cable, um, turn up your laptop and get on the Internet? Money does that. So once again, the goal of all of us is to obtain wealth. Now, wealth isn't the ultimate goal, I believe. I believe the ultimate goal is freedom from want. But money in this society helps facilitate that. So let me get off that soapbox and get back to this. So if this is the goal, there are essentially um, five ways a person reacts to the procedures to attain the goal. So the first one is conformity. Um, in conformity, what you are doing is obeying or surrendering to the rules of the game in order to acquire this particular assess. So you accept the goal um, and what you have to do to the goal or put a goal and then you go through established means in order to obtain that goal. So for us, it is school. Um, you know, whenever we want to improve our lives, we had to retool ourselves. So we had to get back in school. And for many of you, this is probably your fourth time back in school, public education, bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctorate, <laughs> you know. Um, the next is innovation. Um, you want the goal, but you kind of want to do it on your own way. So you may use means that are not necessarily approved by society, but it also ultimately helps you to get to the goal. Um, and it may be just taking a non-traditional route, for example. You drop out of high school and you happen to be able to say words that rhyme at the end of each like line and you put a number of them together with a pretty good beat and now you are a rapper. You're able to acquire multiple millions of dollars, live in houses that no one ever thought you would ever be in, drive cars no one ever thought you would be able to drive in. You obtain that goal of success and acquisition of wealth, but you did it through innovation rather than conformity. Um, so that is another way you deal with strain. You either conform or you innovate. Um, the next one is more ritualistic. You just go along to get along. Um, you're not even sure why you're doing what you're doing. You're just doing it because you were told that this is what you have to do. Undoubtedly, there are students in college today who are only in college because that's what you do after high school. Uh, they don't know what they want to major in. They don't know what they want to do. They're just doing it as a ritual rather than an actual plan. Uh, but that's a ritualistic approach. So you can either conform, innovate, or you can ritualize your pathway to success. The next one is retreatism. And that is the decision to just withdraw from that goal. Like, I don't want your stinking gold. I don't want your money. I'll figure out something else. Um, and you retreat from those uh, desires to reach this goal, and you do it in a way that doesn't offend folks. You, so deciding, well, not, no one decides to be homeless, but being homeless is a retreatism. Um, and some people actually give up and decide to retreat from the system. So I would ask you a question if we were alive together what necessarily is unemployment? Um, and is the unemployment rate accurate? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, unemployment rate means you're out of a job, but you're actively looking, which means you're registered with the Department of Labor, and you have to turn in how many jobs you have searched for. And that's how we calculate the unemployment rate. But there's a group of people beyond the unemployment number, and I'd probably say you could double it in some cases, called a discouraged worker. They have retreated from the system in total. They are on the couch. They're not looking for a job. They're not trying to get a job. They don't want 
nobody's stinking job. You know, um, that is that. And the next person um, is rebellion or the next level of dealing with strain is rebellion. And that's simply to challenge the goal. Like not only do I not want your wealth, but I'm critical of that wealth. I'm critical of society. I don't want anything to society. So I may do slight attacks on society as a form of my rebellion and resistance. Um, but that is essentially what we do uh, when resistance creates strain. Um, and a simpler way of looking at this, of course, is you have these modes, conformity, meaning you accept approved goals, but you pursue them through approved means. Um, innovation, you accept the approved goal, but you use disapproved means. Uh, you do it your way um, rather than what society says you have to do. Um, ritualistic, meaning you don't really even want the goal, but you're just doing it because you were told to. Um, retreatism means you abandon the goal totally. Um, and you follow suit and you just stay silent. Um, and rebellion means you challenge the goal um, and you approve the means of doing it. So you challenge the goal through actively um, critiquing and, and going after the goal. So that is essentially it. Um, that's our last video. And tonight, um, when we talk on Monday, we will actually go through um, how to write the IRB if you have questions about that. Um, and I'll have some samples ready for you. Thank you.